All right. Well, good afternoon. Or wait, is it afternoon yet? What time is it? Okay, it's still morning. Wow. Well, I have the pleasure of wrapping up what I understand to be an incredible conference. Um, and so we're going to make this a great discussion and make it very conversational. But my name is Enisha Shropshire. I am a Dallas native and a, a black business owner. So I am absolutely thrilled to be here representing Path to 1555, which I'll um, talk to you about a little bit uh, in a, as we go along um, to have this discussion on black entrepreneurship. And uh, I am so excited to be joined by these brilliant panelists. I'll start with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Richard A. Johnson III. He's the director of Booker T. Washington Initiative at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Uh, then there's Fran McNeil. She is the executive director of, of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses at the Community College of Philadelphia and so much more, but we'll, uh, we'll get into that. Um, and then uh, Mr. Cliff Barber, he's a partner and soul searcher at Chicago Rises. Um, and that is just their current titles, but we will you know, dive deeper into all the incredible work that they're doing as we go along. You have their bios, so, but you'll learn more about their work as we go into the, dis into the discussion. So before we dive in, I have lots of st stats and numbers, so I have notes. Um, so I'll use them to help guide our, our conversation here. Um, but Path to 1555 is a collaborative initiative designed uh, to grow black business. It is, the 1555 is based on research by the Brookings Institute that states that if 15% of black owned businesses were to add just one employee, that it would grow the US economy by $55 billion. And at the time of the research, it was $55 billion. That number is much um, closer to, um, to a trillion now um, than when we first started this work. But um, I want to start really just by talking a little bit about the, um, you know, as the panel title suggests, that there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of potential in black owned businesses and black entrepreneurship. And that potential is not just to, to the benefit of black business owner, but to the entire US economy. So um, you know, if black owned businesses were to reach parity of their overall share of population, that over 680,000 new, business, um, new businesses would, um, would be created and 6 million new jobs and over 70, $775 billion in revenue would be, would be uh, added to the economy. But I want to start with the work of, of Fran and your work at the um, at Goldman Sachs. Tell us about that and, and, and why you're here. Sure, sure. So I'm Fran McNeil and I'm the executive director of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program at the Community College of Philadelphia. So for clarification, I don't work with gold, I don't work for Goldman Sachs. Um, Community College of Philadelphia is one of 19 physical locations that receives the Goldman Sachs Foundation grant. And over the last 11 years, we have helped 886 small businesses in the tri-state area. So for Philadelphia, that would be Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Southern New Jersey. And um, those individuals, individual small business owners, have created 15,000 jobs and nearly one billion in revenue. Um, what is of interest to the Community College of Philadelphia and the city of Philadelphia is that uh, approximately a third of them are Philadelphia-based businesses and approximately half of those are black and brown businesses. Typically, the requirement to be part of the program is that you must have at least $150,000 in revenue. Um, after the pandemic, that was reduced to $75,000 in revenue and at least two employees. So it is an intensive 100-hour program of peer learning, cohort-based learning, so that small business owners essentially step away for them, from their business for one day on a repeated basis for approximately 14 weeks to gain specific business education skills, um, to learn how to network with each other, and to apply the education and create a growth plan, which is different than a business plan. And I'm explaining those mechanics because 
the concept or the support from the Goldman Sachs Foundation is that there are a lot of programs for startup businesses. <coughs> and an area that has not been covered is for existing small business owners. Mm -hmm. And so to help existing small business owners come out of their business, work on their business, so that's sort of the Michael Gerber quote, work on your business versus in your business, and create a plan for growth as opposed to a business plan is really very critical. And it's been really a pleasure to see the progress of people, A, not only gaining the business knowledge, um, because that's a part of it, but having the opportunity in a peer-based environment to um, work with people from other businesses. So we put people in small groups, and it could be that someone is uh, maybe a hairstylist, but they're sitting next to a plumber, they're sitting next to someone that has a marketing agency, they're sitting next to someone that has a manufacturing agency, and as a growth group, they are learning from each other, challenging each other on uh, concepts. So. That's excellent. And you talk about growth, so I'm going to um, go right over to Cliff. Uh, I know right now uh, you are working with, at Chicago Rises, and which is more venture capital, but you spoke a little bit uh, backstage about, um, about sole proprietorship versus you know, uh, employer firm, um, black businesses. Talk a little bit about your previous work, and we'll come back to your venture capital work, but talk a little bit yeah. about that and, and, and some Yeah, of your... thank you very much. You know, I, uh, just a little bit on myself, I come from Chicago. I know there are several people here from Chicago. I grew up on the south side in, uh, in a small community called mm -hmm. Pill Hill, which is, uh, it's interesting, it, it, uh, it, it turned from being all Jewish to middle class black almost overnight in the 1960s, and it changed the neighborhood dramatically. And I can go back to that, but I grew up there. So I grew up in a relatively comfortable uh, environment. You know, my father was a lawyer, my mother a teacher, as we were just talking about in the last section. Uh, but when I would travel to school, uh, I traveled to high school, I went in the city center, uh, I'd have to go through many neighborhoods, uh, many that are some of the uh, poor and violent neighborhoods you hear about in the press. And I always wondered, why is it like this? You know, as a kid, you don't really know, you're just kind of going through, and it's like, well, that's a bad area, well, that guy got on the bus and it looks tough, why is this? And these were black neighborhoods. So I kind of spent my, my early childhood trying to understand what is the dynamic that has created the difference between where I live and all these other communities that I go through. Uh, and I started studying economics. And uh, so I'm, I'm kind of, I call myself an armchair economist because I did a lot of economics stuff and I love economics. But one of the things that struck me even when I went to business school was when I'd look at these neighborhoods thinking as an economist is the market forces aren't working in these neighborhoods. There's just, there's not a lot of economic activity. So if you're just thinking like an economist, you look like that. And so this was always a curiosity for me growing up. The neighborhood I lived in, Pill Hill, the kind of the high street where all the, the butcher shops were and all that, when we got there, they all disappeared when it became all black uh, in the 1960s. Why was that? I mean, these things just were curiosities for me. So uh, fast forward, I was thinking about this question of market forces which ultimately it's, it's kind of, we're economic actors, right? We have people who have jobs, they work for some place, they have money, they spend the money, and that's kind of how an economy works. And a city is a big economy or a state, and then neighborhoods are small economies, but they're not working in, in our cities, and particularly in our black neighborhoods. And I wanted to understand that question. So uh, I don't want to uh, go too far along this, but I, some of the work I did early on was just trying to understand the data. So you talked about black businesses. One of the first things we looked at was, or I wanted to know was, well, what is the landscape of black businesses? Turns out there are around 2.5 million black businesses in the United States. They're mostly concentrated in the bigger cities, the cities that you would, you would think the usual suspects. Of those, 96% or so are sole proprietorships, meaning they, they're single employer or only, you know, kind of they don't have other employees. 4%, therefore, are ones who have, uh, have, have employees. And of those, 25% only have 50 employees or more. So one of the first things when I came back to Chicago uh, after I went to business school was uh, I, I ran into, I had worked at South Shore Bank uh, that was doing a lot of development banks, uh, development uh, economics in neighborhoods. 
And I went to um, Mary Houghton, who was one of the founders of, of South Shore Bank, this really great you know, interest. And they were using the balance sheet of a bank to try to change the market forces and economics in a neighborhood. So I went to her, and uh, we, were, we were trying to think about what we would, we would do in, the, in these neighborhoods. And the, the prevailing thing was, well, let's try to lend money to black-owned businesses and do affordable housing. Well, we talked about affordable housing yesterday. So those were the two things we did. And ultimately, going down the line of trying to uh, create market forces in these neighborhoods, I was working in Austin on the west side of Chicago. The bank was in South Shore was we realized there just weren't enough black businesses to try to make this engine work. So if you said, hey, let's get more capital to black businesses, well, there just weren't enough of them. Um, so this became a preoccupation for how I thought about, I started to think about, well, let's go back to the question of how we create market forces. Because we know when uh, immigrant communities come into the United States, they often huddle into a ghetto they, they, you know, of, of, of their own. They usually start small businesses, and they start out like that, and then they, they're able to take off. But somehow in the black community, that's not working. So that became, for me, uh, almost like a prevailing, uh, I guess, a, a defining question that I wanted to answer in my career, which was, how do we solve the problem of creating market forces uh, that are working and thriving in poor neighborhoods across not just Chicago, but all cities? So I'll stop there, because that's kind of where I started. It led to many different things I did in my career, but it's been an important factor in the way that I think about economic development, particularly in black neighborhoods, but more generally in poor neighborhoods. And we'll, we'll definitely come back to uh, some of the more recent trends uh, that maybe even your work has impacted how the black business, uh, black business uh, gr gr has grown um, mm -hmm. and accelerated in, in more recent years. I want to make sure to bring in um, Richard into the conversation. Um, you uh, were, were just sharing with me some of the ways in which your family uh, has entered into uh, this uh, there, they, you have your own entrepreneur journey and you have family business that still exists to this day. Talk a little bit about your own journey um, and your thoughts for the potential impact of, of, of black businesses to the U.S. economy. Thank you. I, uh, I was sharing a little bit with you about the history of my family and, uh, you know, my great great grandfather purchased 250 acres in 1881 and started a farm business and we still have our farm business to this day in my family and uh, my mom uh, and my parents moved from Louisiana to Houston uh, to Texas and welcome to Texas everybody yeah <laughs> Texas is a fabulous place for business let me tell you it is um, and so my mom uh, came came and started a business uh, and became an entrepreneur and, and, and managed her business for 40 years and retired and of course, um, I went on to, to college, the United States Army, and came back and I started my own business and, um, and grew it from, from a concept, uh, a need in our community, which was mental health. Uh, so I opened up a drug treatment facility in Houston for inner city boys residential facility and grew it to a 51 bed facility, about $5 million a year, 80, 80 employees. Uh, before I and, 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 and held it for about 13 years and I sold a bit sold the business and decided to come hang out with your scholars and get a doctorate degree in education um, because if you look at the state of Texas Texas is a very wealthy state uh, I'm a native Houstonian I was born in, in Fifth Ward in Houston Texas um, and, and so as a business person I looked at I look at education as edu business our, our, our budget last biennium in the state of Texas was $333 billion. We're a very wealthy state. We had $32 billion surplus. And 53% of our budget is education. So if you say 53% of $333 billion uh, goes to one particular pot, which is education, that's a lot of business. And Texas is extremely pos positioned well for African Americans to participate in business. Um, we have eight historically black colleges and universities in the state of Texas, so we have a strong black infrastructure. Uh, Texas has the largest amount of African Americans that, that 
population in one state. Mm -hmm. And so African Americans do fairly well. If you look at the U.S. Census data report on, on business surveys, along with Texas Workforce Commission, um, over the last decade, black-owned businesses in Texas increased 12.1%, um, which provided an additional 100,000 jobs and 300,000 uh, 300, business, if you include the sole proprietorships. So Texas is a great model for an environment for black owned businesses to grow and thrive. Now, because of that infrastructure, now my job at Texas Public Policy Foundation, I'm the director of the Booker T. Washington Initiative. And Booker T. Washington basically started what we call the National Negro Business League. Booker T. Washington, along with uh, Julian Rosenwald, founded 5,000 schools in African-American communities across the South uh, from pre-K through, through, through eighth grade, which laid the infrastructure for black education coming out of slavery. And not to mention the first president at, at Tuskegee, which, became, which has now become the largest land-owning university for African-American or HBCUs but in the, top, in the top 10 period across the nation with five, over 5,000 acres of land. So, and as we know, real estate is, is the way that we pass down generational wealth. Mm -hmm. Out of the 300 buildings uh, on the Tuskegee campus, 100 of those buildings were built by students. So Booker T said, look, I'm gonna make sure that you understand poetry. I'm gonna make sure you understand philosophy. I'm gonna make sure that you understand mathematics, but you're also gonna learn how to pour a foundation to lay a brick. And, and the students at Tuskegee not only poured foundations, laid brick, and built 100 buildings, they also made the brick. And so one of the things that we do at, at, at Texas Public Policy Foundation under Booker T. Washington Initiative, we look at how we can take the infrastructure of education and move it into Texas workforce. And once you move it into Texas workforce, how we move that into entrepreneurship and, and spurring on black owned businesses, we still fall a little short because even though we're doing it good, I think we can do it better. Mm -hmm. Good is the enemy of great. I think we have an opportunity in Texas to be great. And, and, and I'll talk about some of, the, some of the barriers of that and you'll be surprised when I share with you what the true barriers to the, the explosion of black businesses and, and entrepreneurship in Texas really is. And we're definitely gonna to get to those barriers. Um, but you, you touched on um, the fact that um, really black owned businesses uh, have had the highest percentage of increases in employees, revenue and payroll uh, in 2021, according to a recent Brookings report. I wanna get back to, um, to you, Cliff, that um, a, a lot of that growth has been since the the um, some of the racial justice uprisings in 2020 but talk a little bit more about that trend I know that you know part of what your work started and looking at the um, what seemed to have been the absence of black business and then black business growth and sustainability. Um, but given some of the more, again, the recent data that's showing that black owned businesses are actually in some ways um, growing faster um, and, and uh, than, than, than their peer, uh, than their peers, um, you know, there's still that only 3% of, of black employers, um, I'm sorry, black employers represent around 3% of businesses, even though black people make up about 14% of the population. By comparison, over 80% of employer businesses are, empl are owned by white Americans and up to three um, who make up only three quarters of the, the um, population. So talk a little bit about the trend of, of growth, but yet still that opportunity right. that, that exists. So this is one of the, the issues when we talk, we can look at growth, but sometimes the numbers can be misleading. Because if you have really low numbers and you get something, it's like, well, if you have low numbers, it's kind of the law of large numbers. You're looking at growth, but it's from a very small base. So one of the things I realized when I was doing this work, looking at black businesses was 
Sure, there's, you can see some growth if you had, you know, if 96% of the companies are sole proprietorships and, and then, you know, 4% are ones who are employer co firms. If that grows a little bit, it looks like a big statistic, but it's not making a big impact on neighborhoods. And so one of the first things when I was looking at this work was we were thinking about, well, how do we get more credit to black owned business owners? But two things we realized is black owned business owners are people like me, mostly. Uh, the ones that are kind of in the, in the, uh, the kind of the, the 4%. So they're people who kind of, you know, they're educated, they're college educated. Uh, they've had, a, like for me, I had more advantages in life than many of the people in my own city. And so one question that I had was, uh, and then we also looked at that 4% of people who are multiple employees, and we saw that a lot of them weren't not necessarily hiring black people. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't have the intention to do so. It just means that, hey, if you have a technology company you started in the suburbs, you may not hire very many black people. But the real, so the, it came for me, the question of who are we trying to help? There's a, about the 80% of people who live in the poor neighborhoods of Chicago who have nothing and they're dirt poor. And my thing was, how do I get wealth to them? Then there's another question is like, do I need more wealth <laughs> and, you know, as an entrepreneur? And yes, I would like more wealth, and yes, there are barriers to me getting more wealth, but the real problem are all the people that are in the poorest neighborhoods of Chicago, and how do I get wealth down there? Because that will really change the equation. So that's when we, I kind of switched a little bit from, is getting more capital to just black-owned businesses really gonna change the needle? Or is it people who are focused on getting wealth down to the people who live in the poor neighborhoods? And so I kind of changed a little bit my own focus, which is I'm a little agnostic about who owns the business. I prefer a black owned business because I just do. If I, I think they may make the right decisions, probably. But if we want critical mass, if we want scale, you're gonna have to use anybody who owns the business who has an intention to help those who are in the poor neighborhoods. So that's kind of how I, I, I switched my focus uh, when I was doing this work uh, with South Shore Bank and really kind of had led to, to Chicago Rises. Because the idea was, hey, let's go buy a company that uh, has light manufacturing jobs that are accessible to the poorest uh, neighborhoods in Chicago, where we have the highest violence rates, where we have the most poverty. And because I'm the owner of the means to production or the capital that backs me, mm -hmm. then let's hire people from those neighborhoods. And it turns out that in America, one in six people have a, have a felony record. You can only get, that's the general population. If you go to these neighborhoods in Chicago that I'm talking about, the poorest <laughs> neighborhoods, you can imagine that number is, is a lot higher. So we're talking about if you want to try to make a difference in these neighborhoods, if yesterday what we learned about mobility being tied to uh, having a job, there's a barrier to getting a job. A lot of people, if you have a record, it's very hard to get a job. And then what happens is then you fall back into whatever you're doing before, which in some of these neighborhoods is gang life. So you see how the cycle can be a downward cycle unless you interrupt it. So the idea of Chicago Rises Fund was to go and have a company where we own the means of production, we direct employment to, towards those who are ex-felons and ex-addicted, and really work with them in a for-profit company to really show how you can benefit the company for growth, private equity, but also to hire people who uh, really kind of focus on giving them a second chance. Because that's really the only way going to the sharp end of the people who live in, in what I would call endemic poverty in these neighborhoods, looking at them as trying to create personal transformation in the context of a business is probably the most durable way you're gonna really transform the person, but also the neighborhood. And then one more thing I would say is, uh, back to my comment about market forces, we've had over 50 years of dropping, airlifting loads of money into these neighborhoods for all sorts of social services. And pretty much everyone here would agree, it has not worked. We have not gotten a return on that money. And what we see with every other ethnic group that comes to uh, America, usually when they arrive here, they kind of have two things. They kind of have animal spirits like, hey, you got work for me? <laughs> I'll do it. Uh, I was struck by, uh, sadly, the people who died on the, on the Baltimore Bridge were, were, were all people who had come to this country, but they were just trying to get a, a lift here. And we see that a lot of immigrants, that's one thing they have, is they have animal spirits, that desire to get out and hustle and work. The second one is uh, uh, many of the migrants we know uh, that are coming today and immigrants, they come with a faith. Um, so those two things, 
when you're working with young people, you kind of have to try to get the mindset because that is, we know from the way the American economy works, if you have those two things, you have a hustle mentality and you have, uh, I think, a faith connected to, to, uh, um, to moral truths that come from Christianity, then you actually have the tools you need to thrive. We know that from our early ancestors, our, uh, the, uh, from slavery, they came out with both those things. But somehow that's been lost. It's almost like the drug of, of all the money that's been dropped has kind of been, had a nulling effect on those two things. So the thing is kind of, can you create a business where you revive that? And then when you have that really operating in a neighborhood, then you'll see change. It's kind of organic change in the neighborhood that comes from when market forces are really working. If market forces aren't working, you can drop as much money as you want in there. It's not going to make a blind bit of difference. We've, had, we've seen that. Uh, it doesn't mean there aren't sort of things that you, you have social services to help around the edges. But unless the market forces are working for the poorest people, you're not going to see change. So you, um, you mentioned that, um, that you weren't seeing black entrepreneurs or black businesses actually, the ones who are employee firms, they weren't employing black people. Not all of them. Okay. And, and I, I don't mean that as a criticism because look, you're running a business, you're doing the best you can. There was a business I saw in Minneapolis and it was in the construction business and this guy was hiring loads of people. And he's like, I just can't find black people. He's a black guy own this business, very successful construction, but he's like, I can't find black people to hire. But I'm not going to stop my business to go try to find some black people. It's just that where I am, I have to hire who I can hire. And it turned out it was mostly Hispanic workers, a few black workers. But he's like, I'm a black owner. Yes, I would love it if I could hire 80, no, 90% black people. I just can't find them, but I have a business to run. And, and I, I, you know, I don't fault him for that. Now, there are some businesses that happen to be located in black neighborhoods, and maybe they hire 100 percent and great and, and, you know, great for that person and great for that neighborhood. This is what I'm trying to do intentionally. But I'm not going to blame a black entrepreneur because they can't hire other black people. They're trying to make it work and good on them. You know, that's the way the, the capitalist mar market works. Um, so, yeah, so that's but that is the fact that you just can't legislate this with a lot of black entrepreneurs. They're trying to do their best to grow a company. If it happens to be in a neighborhood where there are other, uh, where they can hire black people, most of the ones I meet would say, yes, absolutely. If it doesn't, then you just have to go with what works. But it just turns out you have a small base of businesses and m a lot of them just can't hire because of just location sometimes. So Fran, I want to um, talk to you about more about your work and um, you mentioned in just some of our uh, uh, pre-conversation pre about key drivers for uh, company value that you focus on in helping equip black-owned businesses for, for growth and sustainability. Talk a little bit more about, uh, sure. about some of those values. Sure, So I sit here sort of carrying multiple roles. Um, I too am an entrepreneur, and I also work for the Community College of Philadelphia, which is very deeply connected to workforce and making sure that the citizens of Philadelphia, um, and we have our first, the 100th mayor of the city of Philadelphia is now the first black female mayor, and so while uh, fighting crime is certainly a priority, having uh, black businesses and businesses of color grow is also a priority. So in the, my work with very structured systems, what I found is a lot of businesses are focused on survival, black businesses. And you mentioned the statistic of many black businesses are sole proprietors, and most black businesses don't reach one million in revenue. So there is a system that looks at the eight key drivers of company value. And in that work, what I have found is helping business owners in a systematic way look at those eight key drivers and help them either through a small group uh, work or mastermind group work, help them focus on growing their business, scaling their business for sale um, allows them to really be part of the concept of they're not just creating a business so that they have a job, but instead they're creating a business that is connected to providing value 
um, in this case, to city services. So they are looking at getting city contracts, they're looking at getting private industry contracts, and they're looking at having a sustainable business that employs people. Part of what the college does is then make that connection to say, as a city's college, who primarily our average student is a black female with two children, age 38. And so we're interested in making sure that individuals within the city of Philadelphia get the education, get the associate's degree. If they choose to go on and get a four-year degree, that's fine. However, the college has a lot of technical programs, certificate programs, badge-worthy programs that people can then get plugged into the workforce. Um, one of our programs is an entrepreneur certificate program, and the concept is someone will learn how to start a business, then there's a program that actually was started by the mayor when she was in city council that works with black and brown businesses who are less than a million and are located in the city. And then the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program looks at businesses that are greater than a million and beyond. So the concept is that whether it's a black and brown business or a business that is located in the city, that it's critical that they're following a certain structure that is focused again on growth and scale and that black businesses and brown businesses should, if they are looking at and kind of building into the topic of this conference, prosperity, the idea of having a business that is an investment and an asset that someone wants to acquire is an important one for entrepreneurs to think about at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, in my work with entrepreneurs, we build that in right from the beginning. So growing black businesses, as, as, we, as we have been talking about, is important, but there are a lot of barriers that exist to that, that's preventing that growth. Um, according to new, um, a recent report by um, the New York Fed, a 2021 report, that white-owned small businesses are two times likely to be fully approved for financing despite being considered, despite the black-owned business being considered low risk. Um, most black-owned businesses, and, and maybe some of your work has, has shown this, that they're mostly funded by friends and family and bootstrapping. Um, one of the biggest barriers to, to growth at, from some of the work that, that I've been engaged in is underwriting and how, you know, again, even credit worthy uh, entrepreneurs are just not receiving the capital that's needed to grow their business. Um, many assume that it's based on some, you know, analytical decision making, but really um, they're just practices in um, underwriting that just need to be addressed and, and looked at. 13% of black owned firms received only 13% of black-owned firms received all the financing that they sought compared to 40% of whites, and 46% received none of the financing that they sought. So, um, Richard, talk to us about, you You were really excited to get to the barriers, so um, <laughs> bring us, bring us to talk to us about this, these barriers to growth. I told you, it's not gonna be what you think. <laughs> Actually, uh, I, uh, I, I probably didn't get a, a loan for my business until I think it, it probably was after about the eighth and ninth year. Matter of fact, my, it was the president of my bank that came to me and he said, hey man, you know, your business is doing so well and you're running so much money through our banks. Why, you, don't, you don't even have a revolving line of credit with us. Can we give you a half million dollar revolving line of credit? I said, man, look, I, I really don't want to get into that. And he said, well, look, we'll just put it there for you, mm -hmm. you know, just in case, you know, because it depends on how you manage your business as well. You know, I grew my business from $10,000 a month to, to seven, $800,000 a month, but, you know, in terms of billing and receivables. But, but that's, that's not the biggest barrier to the growth of black businesses. Um, and I like to use Texas as an example, simply because Texas is a business state. We're, we're right now, I think, around the ninth largest economy in the world. And, you know, I grew up in Houston, which is the energy capital of the world. 
Uh, and we have the fifth largest port in the world. And so we're moving a lot of money through Texas. Now, how do I, as a black man in Texas, in, in this large, huge economy, not find myself in all of that? And I can tell you back to the infrastructure side uh, of things is where we have in our greatest challenge. The Texas legislature gives, has awarded the state of Texas $3 billion a year, $3 billion a year for CTE, Career Technology Education, which is the old vocational education programs. Mm -hmm. If you go back and you look at Vocational Education Act of 1963 and the, and the amendment in 1968, which basically provided you know, financial support for all schools across America to start what? Vocational and trade training in high school. And somewhere we lost around 1980s, we lost that and we developed uh, we moved it out of the high schools largely and into the community college. That's when you saw the community college boom. And, and basically, you know, the things that we were learning in, at, at 16, 17, and 18 years old, now the average age of a community college student is 20, 26 or 27 years old. And for the black community, in between that time, a lot of those guys bumped their heads and before you know it, they got a felony and they say, look, I better go back and learn me a trade. And so Texas is now moving swiftly back, what I call back to the future, yeah. you know, and, and, and saying, look, let's invest now in the trades and in the African-American community right here in the state of Texas. We're still, from a demographic standpoint, we're lagging behind other demographics in, in electrical, uh, plumbing, 40% 40 40 in electrical, 42% plumbing, well, and 60% in, 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 in carpentry and, and, and home building. And so we're not training entrepreneurs the way that we should train entrepreneurs and have an infrastructure for entrepreneurial and, and career development. Because I, here's the reason why. We bought into a fallacy that every student should get a bachelor's, master's, and doctor degree in liberal arts and sciences. And that's how we, we hung a success badge around their necks. And that's when we saw Texas. It, that's when, in 1979, Texas had 17 state prisons. By the year 2000, Texas had 137 state prisons. Right. The dropout, the, 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 the academic performance rate went from here to here because we assume and we bit into the apple that every student should get a college degree. And we turned our backs and we closed the door on industry. We closed the door and we opened the door to the criminal justice system, which created what we now call the school to, the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. Now, why is Texas so unique for black folks right now? is because we've turned back and said, let's invest in career technology education. Right. Here's the biggest number one problem I'm having. At the Booker T. Washington Initiative, I work in a think tank. Here's the biggest number one problem we're having in terms of moving that policy forward. And you never would guess it. It's black folk, it's leaders, it's black politicians continuing to push out in the community that your kid don't need to take the trades. Your kid need to get a, a college degree. When in essence, my biggest fight is, Richard, you're trying to open the door to, you're trying to open the door to industry and you're trying to move folks going from college to get a college degree. No, I'm not. I'm trying to close the door to the criminal justice system. If that means opening the door to industry, leaving the door open, because I also served eight years in the military, in the army. So leaving the door open to the military, industry, and to higher education. Mm -hmm. Those doors I won't open. I want to close the doors to the prisons. Right. And the way that we do that, we have to overcome ourselves, our own black leadership. We, we, at Texas Public Policy Foundation, we, we move forward what we call the paid apprenticeship, paid internship mm -hmm. policy. Mm -hmm. 
out of 17 black state representatives and two black state senators, one black state representative supported it. No, two. Mm -hmm. Two black state senators supported it. One is a Republican, the only one, we only have one black state representative who's a Republican. He supported it. And the black state representative who wrote the bill, my good friend, she's being challenged right now by other Democrats in her primary. They primaried her. So when you talk about, we don't point, there's no need to point the finger. It's not even funding. Funding is not our issue. Infrastructure is our issue. If you, if you go to the core of it, you get down to the root, you have to have an infrastructure, a pipeline to success. If we're not churning out black, black entrepreneurs in our thought, and our thinking, if we're not thinking about careers, we're not thinking about business, we're gonna get caught up to what Cliff was saying, and here's my, big, here's my other competitor. My biggest problem is black leadership. My biggest competitor is the drug dealers on the street. You know why? Because they have a paid internship and they have a paid <laughs> apprenticeship. Absolutely. <laughs> And they take those interns in and they pay them and they make sure that what? They're helping their single parent mothers as we talked about 70% of our families coming up with single parents. They're helping them pay the bills. But the way, that you, the way that you wash bad money out of street is with good money. Mm -hmm. and, and I told the folks at HISD, Houston Independent School District, which my colleague in the, in the panel before, Charles mentioned, has been taken over by the state. Thank God for the leadership here in the state of Texas. Because if it had not been for Governor Abbott, he never would have, it, it, um, HISD would never have been taken over, which they should have been, because they were the number one culprits of the school to prison pipeline and cutting off black businesses in, in, at, the, at the knees. I told them, look, they said, our teachers need, our schools need more money. There's $3 billion a year. This is your, you get your school allotment here, that CTE money is on top of your school allotment. If you want more, you want to grow your budget, grow your budget at your school, do what? Increase your career technology education programs. Mm -hmm. And get one last thing, and I want to make this point. And that is, when you, Governor Abbott, in the state of Texas, now remember, we're a very wealthy state. So we're going to get the best research. 95%, 95% of the students that took two or more, what we call concentrators in career technology education, took two or more career technology edu education courses, 95% graduated. 95% graduated. Of that 95% that graduated, 70% of them went on to get what we call stackable certif certifications and degrees mm -hmm. in higher education. So if you want to move black folk forward, you create the infrastructure and the pipeline in order to do that. And the biggest barrier to that is the, and, and most of those folks are Democrats. 90% of the folks that oppose these policies are Democrats. And they're opposing these policies for the sake of lifting up what we call liberal white Democrats moving a black agenda in the wrong direction. And so if black folks stand up and get beyond the barriers of ourselves. We can grow our business far beyond this 12.1% in Texas, and then uh, allow other states to look at what Texas is doing, black people in other states, look at what Texas is doing, and take these models, these stems, and, 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 and apply it in your own states, because it's replicable. Thank you. So I, that was, um, a lot of really... <laughs> I'm passionate about it because I, it's a all, heck of a fight. We can all tell you're passionate about it. Um, 
And you know, there are a lot of interesting points made there and pipeline is absolutely important. Preparing the black business is absolutely important, but there's an ecosystem problem as well. So even as a pipeline is created, even as the black owned business is, is being prepared and partnered and, and, and equipped with ways to, to grow their business, to, to have an entrepreneurial mindset, to grow their business, and then they come into, again, the, the, the numbers are still clear that black businesses are not getting funded as um, as as easily and um, as off as regularly as their counterparts. They're just not that that those are just the facts. Um, one of the things that is currently pre preventing uh, some of that growth is some of this anti DEI legislation that exists. There are lawsuits right now that are challenging and pushing and stopping funding that that was designed for black owned women owned businesses simply on you know on bases that you know that are really unfounded so you know absolutely there's a there's a there's a pipeline but it's a yes and there's not a there's it's not a it's not one thing or another thing it's a yes and there is there's a need for a pipeline but there's also a need to address these um, these the, the ecosystem that exists that once the pipeline is created what are they coming into what what walls are they hitting to be able to even actually grow their their business the fearless fund lawsuit the the lawsuit against hello Alice you know these are all funding mechanisms that are the pr are primary ways in which um, uh, black entrepreneurs are accessing capital to, in order to be able to become employer businesses. So let's talk a little bit about some, some of those. Um, some of those. I think you want to chime well, in on a couple well, things. But. Certainly, there, we are part of an ecosystem. It's not just um, an economic ecosystem. And so part of what this conference is doing is looking at each of the segments that bring society together. And we're ending the conference with entrepreneurship. Um, as my colleagues have identified, bringing together the spiritual aspect, the workforce aspect, the educational aspect, and combining that and really looking at how that impacts black and brown entrepreneurship is critical. Um, again, I'm going to reference the community college perspective in that um, our president actually wrote a book about Booker T. Washington. Um, so Dr. Generals is very passionate about that particular approach. And so at the college, we look at workforce. So we combine the academic side and also the workforce side to make sure students in high school have a chance to be part of a dual career program. We make sure that there are certificate and badge related programs so that if someone is um, someone can partner with our hospitals in Philadelphia it's very much in eds and meds so the hospitals and the life sciences are providing jobs as well as entrepreneurship opportunities for business owners and so we're making sure that we're looking at workforce from the student perspective, from the business owner perspective, from the societal and cultural perspective, and we're making sure that as a business owner, if they want to be part of that, and we're starting actually with the high school level, that people can get technical certifications, work in the industry, whether it's the education industry or the life science industry, we don't have the oil, um, <laughs> so that they can then, maybe it's at age 20, maybe it's at age 25, maybe it's at age 30, then work with businesses, so sort of like your uh, model, and have the opportunity to be part of an employee ownership plan or start a business or be able to provide contracts or get contracts. So um, it, it's just important to, um, I guess one of my concerns about the statement that it's just access to credit um, as Richard has identified, black businesses can survive, and it's painful, and it is unfair. They can survive without credit. What is important is to then identify ways that some of our institutional um, support systems that are often very racist can be elevated and held accountable to making sure that business owners, I mean, you, you identified, the president of the bank came to you and said, 
my goodness, there's a lot of money flowing through here. We're essentially not capitalizing on, on what you're doing. We better pay attention to you. And Cut definitely not, yeah. not, not a, it's not only a capital. Again, less than 1% of VC funding goes to black-owned businesses. And these are lost opportunities for Friends and for family growth. funding. I, and for any business, friends and family funding is a start. And I guess what I, I don't want to minimize, you talked about the inter immigrant community, they self-fund. Um, so I am not saying don't hold larger financial institutions accountable, but I'm also saying don't minimize the importance of friends and family funding as a um, opportunity to start and grow black businesses. Absolutely. But I think we want to make sure and be clear about there's, we're actually talking about two pipelines here. Because mm -hmm. there's the pipeline of black entrepreneurs. You've been very focused on that and you said the common capital. There's the other one, the pipeline of what I would call the workforce pipeline of people with technical skills. You mm -hmm. talked about that. So how do we take young men and women and on that one pipeline you talked about, Richard, which is equip them so that they can go work for a steel, in, our, in the context of Chicago, a steel company or a plastic injection molding company. They, we need welders, we need electricians. We, that's a certificate, we need to get people skilled up so they can go work for, it doesn't matter black owned or not, just a company in Chicago. And that is the ticket out. We heard that yesterday from the Harvard, you know, mobility comes from having those jobs. So that is a pipeline. That pipeline is being blocked, as you said. That is being blocked in every single state that I know of. Uh, certainly in Illinois, uh, we've had the same kind of defunding of that, and it needs to be refunded, as you talked about. Um, on the other pipeline, which is entrepreneurs, having worked in that, I'm, I'm a little less concerned about it because I don't see that it has the same impact. I think, here's the thing, we're, we're at a state where which of these pipelines can have the bigger impact on the poorest people? For me, it's the one Richard talked about. We can get some more black <coughs> entrepreneurs and we can open up the credit, the spigot there and get more credit to them. That will make some difference. It will take a longer time. Where we can get a lot of bang for buck is right what Richard talked about. So I look at both, but in my work, where you're gonna get the bang for the buck in community economic development, going to the, the people who are the poorest in the neighborhood, getting wealth directly to them and then creating market forces in a neighborhood, it's through that pipeline. The entrepreneur one is important and you're right, I spent a lot of time, I actually was an underwriter for a while at South Shore Bank. We underwrote uh, SBA loans. If you look at uh, SBA loans and the amount of, as a proxy for credit into black businesses, it's appalling. It's appalling. It's something like 2% of all SBA, because you can't take race for any other, uh, you have to use that as the proxy for race because banks don't, don't report race in any other way. But only 2% of SBA loans in, in uh, five years ago went to black owned businesses. That's a proxy of just the trickle of credit that's going to black owned businesses. And you're right, it's worse for equity. That's debt capital. So we know there's a problem with credit flow and that, uh, that needs to be solved. But of the two that I look at, I'm a little more concerned about how we open up this spigot, although both need to be, both are avenues for growth. I wanted to um, open it up for questions. I just want to make sure to be clear that it's, it, again, it's a yes and. There has to be focus in there. Folks that need to be focused on the on on this spigot. Um, but there's also the, the fact that Investing in black businesses creates jobs. They create jobs and they add to the economy in a way that um, that that is just being lost, is being missed in and with not enough focus. Because again, it's there's need to be focus on pipeline, there needs to be focus on investing in black owned businesses and black entrepreneurship to create employer firms so that they can add jobs, so they can add um, uh, add to the economy in a way that is absolutely fruitful because most black businesses do actually employ more black people than, um, than not. That's so true. I do want to no, open let me, up for let questions. Me do real, real quick to that it, because I think it's important. You know, I talked about my, the president of my bank, but it was mm -hmm. Union National Bank, it was a black owned bank. And mm -hmm. so they're, they're, they're black owned, they're black owned banks, they're black owned Which is institutions. Rare. 
and uh, and 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 they're and 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 they're pretty aggressive with with successful business people uh, about about lending their money. And the other thing is, I also sit on the board of Texas Southern Universities. I'm a board of region there, and it's a historically black university here. And we're doing a hundred million dollar uh, building project right now. And one of the things that when 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 black folks are in charge, when you're in charge. You need to look with an eye to 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 help other black businesses. And so if we're going to do one hundred million dollars worth of building. You know, I'm looking at, OK, what what African-American uh, entrepreneurs we have out there in plumbing. Mm -hmm. There's electrical. There's concrete. There's all these things. There, there's there's architects, designs, mm -hmm. all these things that that go into building those kinds of facilities. Now, do when we're in charge, we can we can actually say, look, I want to make sure that I want to give these people an opportunity and we need to give ourselves an opportunity. That's the number one thing. Black folks have to begin to look with an eye to help black people become independent. That's Booker T. Washington, mm -hmm. self-reliant and independent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm an uh, education professor, so I look at things through that lens, and I'm looking at Texas, and I'm looking at Chicago and um, the Milwaukee area, both the areas I'm familiar with. In Texas, according to the National Assessment of Education Progress, African Americans are number one in literacy, it compared to their counterparts anywhere else. In order to be successful in career technical education training, you really need to be reading at at least a 10th grade level. Texas is uh, an accountability state. George W. Bush implemented an accountability system, making schools accountable to teaching black kids to read at a high level. Milwaukee and the Chicago area don't have that accountability, and black kids can't read. Houston got taken over Milwaukee and Chicago should have been taken over decades ago if we care about black literacy. So how does that relate to economics, the economic future? Career technical education is such a open door for our, particularly our young men who are hopeless in other economic areas. But if you can't read, you can't do it. All right. Uh, Bar you know, First Lady Barbara Bush, you know, she she when she first came out with with the Reed Foundation, she just said, simply, we need to teach these kids how to read. And and a lot of the a lot of the black scholars in our community laughed at her saying we need to teach. These. She's saying we need to teach our kids how to read. And so I said, well, look. She's the first lady of the United States of America. That means her husband was the president. And then she, she became the first mother of the United States of America. It means her son was a president. And her other son is the governor of, a, of another large state. Maybe she knows something that we don't know. <laughs> Maybe there's some validity to what she said. Maybe she has some research that we don't have. And so I started supporting reading. And that's when I found out, I, I looked at our criminal justice system and 70% of our folks that are in the Texas criminal justice system are reading at a third and fourth grade level. Blacks in Texas now make up 12% of the population. Hispanics make up 41.5% of the population. Whites make up 40% of the population. But we make up 34% of the population in prison, and they both make up 33%. So that 12%, we're being affected most. And so who should be screaming about reading more than anybody and career technology education more than anybody is black people and black men particularly. And so that's the fight we're on. And you're spot dead on that this is the avenue into industry, military, and higher ed. 
and closes that door on the criminal justice system. And mind you, that of that 70% in the Texas criminal justice system that's reading at a third and fourth grade level, they had never been tested for dyslexia. 80% of them, once they get tested in prison, 80% were found to have dyslexia, something that we could have dealt with when they were in the third and fourth grade. My, my son has dyslexia and my daughter has dyscalculia. She came to me, she says, Daddy, I don't see the numbers the way you see them. And when I had her tested, that's when I had never heard of dyscalculia. I say, I heard of dyslexia, but not dyscalculia. And they said, your daughter, has, she said, they said, but we can treat her for that. Now she, she has an A in mathematics. What if we had those opportunities and took those opportunities with those young people? We failed them. I want to make sure to get to a couple more questions. Yeah, um, let's go right here. Yeah, after the George Floyd incident, just like Merrill Lynch, lots of places in corporate America committed themselves to having more suppliers, whether it's Target, more supply. There was a plethora of large companies that in what seemed like in very concrete ways were going to aid black businesses. Uh, I don't know what's come of that, maybe. That was mostly you know, window dressing. What? Right. That was mostly window dressing. If you look at the, the facts about it, most of it just went away. It was a promise that was never kept. And the other issue is capacity building. Aside from credit, which is something that people look at immediately, small businesses across America, one of their biggest challenges is finding workers. So you need to have workers that can read, that can perform the skills that add value to your company so that you can sell your products and services um, and, and make a profit. And so that connection between workforce and business and the community is really critical. It is an ecosystem. It's an economic ecosystem. It's a political, social ecosystem. And it really is why I think it's admirable that the conference is ending with entrepreneurship as the area. Yes. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I want to thank you, Anisha, for, because those of us at AEI and at the Manhattan Institute and certainly at Hoover as well, we do a lot on politics. We do a lot on culture. We do a lot on universities. We do a lot on families. But we understand that you can't be in the United States and not recognize that commerce and business and employment and economics is the biggest driving force of upward mobility and economic opportunity. So I am very pleased that we ended on this point because it can't be forgotten how important employers and business development and prosperity is to all Americans and also to black Americans. So I really compliment you, Anisha, and this panel. And I want to just finish by saying thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you to my colleagues at the Manhattan Institute and at Hoover. Thank you to uh, the people here at Old Parkland, to our respective staffs. Uh, really was an outstanding conference, and I'm just so proud to be part of it. I want to say one other thing. Keep in touch. We are developing a community here. That's what we do. We develop community, we share ideas, and we don't want it to stop here. We want it to continue. Come back next year, but keep the progress going. Keep in touch. Go to each other's conferences. Share with each other. Remain in touch. That's so important for our ability to help change the country. And then finally, take what you heard here and master it if you like it and believe in it, and take it out to the, your communities as well. It's not, uh, it's, it's, we're only as good as how much we can project the ideas and the facts and the, the, the philosophies and the perspectives that we learned here. So we're going to work with Manhattan and work with Hoover to develop a video that rep reproduces a lot of these conversations and packages in a way that can advance these ideas in the country in a much bigger way. Not 60 or 70 people here in, in Dallas, but a million or more Americans hearing these ideas. And only in that way will we really take what we've learned so much here and advance it in a way that makes our country stronger and better. So with that, thank you all, great conference, and uh, stay in touch. Thanks. <laughs>